and uh, I'm just not your seminar type of guy. So if I get if I get to preaching, which is what I'm, I'm a preacher, I'm going to be preaching. If I get excited about the Word of God, don't don't have a cardiac arrest over about it, right? And the fact is, I did give them a seminar, and they were disappointed. In fact, the pastor came to me uh, one day, pulled over to my camper. He said, get in my car, i got to have a talk with you. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble then. And he said, uh, he said, if I wanted you to come for a revival meeting, I would have scheduled a revival meeting. <laughs> and uh, but they're not here for a revival meeting. They're here to hear about prophecy. And I thought about that for a moment, and I kindly told the preacher, well, brother, that is revival preaching. It is prophecy. Right. I mean, if you're, if you're here to just kind of get a panorama view of prophecy, I can give you a book on it, you know? I get, I get a lot of good books. I wouldn't get the current books. They're all messed up. I wouldn't get the Left Behind series. That's messed up. Mm -hmm. But I, I would definitely... There's some good old-fashioned uh, books on dispensational truths and and premillennialism and all of that. I'm sure pastors taught on it over the years and yeah. probably taught on it, you know, Bible classes. You know, I understand all that. But uh, I'm not here to give you a seminar. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not really here to make you feel right. bad either. Right. But I'm here to demonstrate what Bible prophecy is all about, and you will definitely. But uh, this morning, uh, I, I like to preach on what Bible prophecy produces. What, what it really, what's the aim of God to give us prophecy? I mean, there's more about prophecy in the Bible than any other subject in the Bible. Just, just about the Lord Jesus, there's over 300 prophecies about His first and second coming. In the book of Isaiah, there's over 100 prophecies about the Messiah. Now, there are a multitude of prophecies in the Bible about various things. Uh, but what is the object? What is the major motivations for prophecy? How, how many want to know that? Huh? Amen? I mean, how many really want to know? Why do we need to hear old-time, Bible-believing, prophecy preaching? Now, back in the days of D.L. Moody and, uh, and R.A. Torrey and, and Billy Sunday and... Uh, and there was a preacher, by the way, a lot of people don't know, he was popular in the South, and I kind of kid a little bit when I say that the only ham that I've ever eaten was the ham that I ate with my son every day. <laughs> and uh, it was the, I read uh, to him the autobiography of Mordecai Ham. <laughs> and uh, you ought to get a really great book on uh, his autobiography, and he pretty much says that they wouldn't even give an invitation. Listen to me. When they were having the big tent meetings, you know, they wouldn't even give an invitation until three weeks. Three weeks they wouldn't even give an invitation. I said, wow. And uh, he said, the, well, he said the reason for that was we got to get the backsliders right with God first before we see the sinners coming and get saved. Wow. And uh, so that's interesting, isn't it? So uh, we got to get the backsliders right with God. If you want to see revival break out. Then the other thing was that one time I came to a meeting and, and again they, and I, I really thankfully don't have my name on the, your outside electronic board out there. Uh, I, I really I actually appreciate that. I was actually, uh, one of the first meetings I came uh, for revival, uh, they had a big old sign there and it said, uh, uh, Dr. Free preaching, you know, such, such a day. And it said these words, Revival in progress. And I thought to myself, man alive, if revival's in progress, what am I doing here? I'm probably going to mess it up. <laughs> and in, in the South, you know, typically a lot of churches will schedule three, two, three revivals a year. And I got to think about that. Can we really schedule revival? I mean, wouldn't that be great? You know, just by saying, the Holy Ghost, I expect you to be here such and such a day. In such and such a month. And we expect you to be here. Now ladies and gentlemen, revival does not happen that way. Right. Revival only happens when the Spirit of God uh, believes you have met the conditions for Him to come. He is not going to send revival unless the conditions are met. And prophecy, Bible prophecy, 
is really a way to prepare our heart for the second coming of Christ, uh, but it's also to help you live for God before He appears. Now, one of the one of the number one motivators of Bible prophecy is to get ready for the judgment seat of Christ. That's for believers only. The judgment seat of Christ. That's what you ought to be thinking about. Now, a lot of people ask me, what do you think the rapture is going to happen? Well, we're not supposed to know anyway. We're not supposed to know uh, the hour, the day, the season, right? It's not of our business. And, and by the way, uh, the whole idea is we're not supposed to know because we're supposed to be watching for him to come like even now while I'm preaching. Wouldn't it be great if the Lord Jesus came right now? I mean, if he came right now, would you be ready? Well, we have to say, now, wait a minute, I, I, Lord, give me another 10 minutes. I got to get my house in order here. I got to throw away my, uh, my romance novels. I got to get rid of this. I got to get rid of that. No, it'll be too late then. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, you got to be ready now. You got to be ready now for the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not looking for the rapture. I'm not looking for the rapture. I have to be focused as a believer on the judgment seat of Christ because that's the next prophetic event on the prophetic calendar of God. You say, you don't believe in the rapture? I didn't say I don't believe in the rapture. I said I'm not looking for the rapture because the rapture, ladies and gentlemen, is the mode of transportation. <laughs> it's how I'm going to get there. And if we, we need to get focused on the right thing, ladies and gentlemen. Wouldn't you agree? The judgment seat of Christ. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And here's the reason for the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may get, receive the things done in his body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. This is talking to believers here. We know it's talking to believers because we didn't get saved by what we did, good or bad, right? right? We got saved because the one who was sinless, he died for the sinners. Amen. Amen. The, the just one died for the unjust, that's you and I. The righteous one who died for the unrighteous ones, like you and I. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. We were lost sinners before we got saved. Yeah. And if you're not born again, you're a lost sinner right now. That's right. But we will be meeting the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And the time clock for the judgment seat of Christ, ladies and gentlemen, starts the millisecond we're caught out of here and we're taken up there in that bridal chamber that I talked about. That bridal chamber is actually conforming to the Jewish wedding where the bridegroom uh, would tell his bride, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And until then, I want you to get yourself ready. And uh, but when I come, you don't know when I'm going to come, but when the Father gives me the green light, I'm going to take off and I'm going to kidnap you. Now, the Bible says it could be in the morning, it could be in the noon, and or it could be in the evening. And by the way, depending on what side of the globe you're living on, amen, it, it will be all three, I believe that. Amen. 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 And then the idea is that he would come and the bridegroom, and then the, the trump, uh, the last trump would be blown, and when the bride hears the sound, or the sounds of the last trump, uh, why she's already gone, and mommy and daddy goes in there and says, "What happened to our What happened to our daughter? Well, she's been kidnapped because everybody knows that the bridegroom has kidnapped the daughter. They've been taking her to the bridal chamber, and for seven days now she's in this bridal chamber, getting herself ready for the wedding day, and." Uh, and then after the seven days, the bridegroom introduces his bride and says, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my chaste bride. And she has that white wedding garment. And anyway, that's what it means, you, you ladies now. When you got married and you had a white wedding garment, you know what that meant? That meant you were chaste. That's what it means. And uh, well, those seven days... They uh, compute prophetically to seven years. And we know.
know that because it's not until the end of the seven year tribulation in uh, Revelation chapter 19 that the bride is given her wedding garments. You see what I'm saying? So for seven years, the judgment seat of Christ will take place. And I thought to myself, seven years of the judgment seat of Christ? And that's why I believe in old fashioned altar calls right here. I, I believe, I, I don't know how many tissue boxes you have here, but I would recommend this week we get one on every corner of this altar. I really do. And I'll tell you what, I think the tissue boxes up here are not to blow your nose necessarily, but, but, but I would tell you there ought to be, uh, there ought to be uh, contrition over sin. Amen? I, I believe that you and I, the reason for Bible prophecy for the believer is that we might have short accounts but before we see the Lord face to face. And that John said, we would not be ashamed of his coming. Right. I hope you're not ashamed that his coming. Wouldn't it be horrible to look Jesus in the face and be so embarrassed and so shamed that you haven't given your best for the Lord? Wouldn't it be terrible if all that he'd done for you? Right. Listen, it's been great enough if God just saved me from hell, but he did more than that. Amen. I hope he will live with him for eternity. With a glorified body. Think about that. A glorified body. Won't need these glasses anymore. I have atomic eyesight. I be able to see the, the molecules and the atoms and the neutrons. Hey man, that's something to shout about right there. And if you like to eat like I do, good Lord to God. Hey man, we'll get to eat and eat meat for a thousand years and get a pound. Hallelujah. But there won't be no pork. <laughs> Or you won't miss it. <laughs> Have you ever noticed why it says the marriage supper of the Lamb? Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, except for the except for the priests uh, there during the millennial temple, uh, we're basically go, basically going to be vegetarians. Well, we'll have a glorified body, so uh, <laughs> you know it's just. That the whole concept is just really amazing. We'll actually be able to eat. I mean, remember when Jesus resurrected and he appeared to the disciples, did he not sit down and, and eat with them? I mean, he ate with them, the Bible said. And, 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 and so he got to eat. And I guess we'll get to eat too in the millennium. No doubt about it. But what I'm saying here, dearly beloved, is from day to day, as born again believers, we want to have short accounts on the Lord, right? Now, uh, I, I don't want to be a spectator for seven years. I, I want to be, I want to just be there. I want to get it over with. I, I want, I want, I want to have a short account. So I don't know what you're doing. And, and listen to me, I'm not your, I'm not your priest. I don't wear a dress. Give me an amen. But we don't have professional boots back there. Can I tell you what I did when I was in Israel last time? <laughs> I know the Roman Catholics would hate me if they knew it was me. <laughs> but I went into the, the big church over there in Nazareth. In Nazareth and uh, Has anyone been to, to Israel, by the way? Any of you folks? Well, there's definitely something. we got to get your pastor and his dear wife to Israel. we got to get him to Israel. Amen. And, uh, but, but when I was up there, and, and I, I didn't want to go into the Roman Catholic thing, but it was part of the, you know, you had to go there or whatever. But I, I went there. I thought to myself, there was a, this was a big building, and they had these confessional boots lined, uh, I mean, from the front all the way to the back. Gotta be like 30, 40 of them on one side, same thing on the other side. And then they had Mary, a statue of Mary, and she had her hands up like this, with, with the fingers like that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, Brother Don and I were there, and of course, everywhere we went, we always have a big stack of gospel tracts with us, amen? If you go anywhere with gospel tracks, you might as well just get on the altar now and confess that you are backslidden. You ought to leave this place with a big stack of tracks. That's right. And uh, so there we have big back uh, pack of uh, tracks, you know. And I, I looked at Don, Brother Don, and he looked at me, and, uh, and we both kind of chuckled. <laughs> and he said, what are you chuckling back? I said, I said, Brother Don, I want you to go get a track in every one of those confessional booths. And I'm going to go do something, you'll be shocked. But afterwards, you'll understand why I'm doing it. So he did. He went into every one of them, put them in the conventional boots. And then I went to Mary. Oh, I went to Mary. Oh, Mary. Bless her heart. And I put a gospel track in every 
every one of those fingers. I wonder if the pastor, if the priest had a cardiac arrest, you know, when he did that. And then we went in there and we put the tracks in their hymn books and uh, he said you should have done that. Well, why not? Why not? Why should I have done that? How else are the Catholics going to get the gospel? I mean, how difficult it is to reach Roman Catholicism. How, how else am I going to reach them with the gospel? What if a Roman Catholic is open to him book and takes it out and puts it in the pocket and later on reads it and, and, and realizes and gets on the Holy Ghost conviction that Mary can't save them? The Pope can't save her. Amen. Amen. And by the way, that has happened many times. I remember a brother, you may know him, uh, but he uh, he uh, he learned how to fly and he flew and he had this bag of tracks that so you may know the story and and uh, he decided God put it on his heart to fly over the Vatican. <laughs> and he had to be very, uh, you know, very uh, covert about it. And they didn't know what he was doing. He rented the plane over there in Italy. And, and he flies over there. And he had to practice uh, for months, I guess. He practiced and he went around and around. And then he, and then he did this with, with this, uh, this, I don't know, the Piper plane. And he did this like that, right? That, and the whole, the whole bunch of tracks, it had to be thousand, out of 10,000 tracks. Fell out of the plane. He did it on purpose now. And again, landed everywhere in the Vatican. <laughs> the whole Vatican. Where there, were, where there were thousands of Roman Catholics visiting. You said, said really? Can, should we do stuff like that? Well, why not? Why not? Now, he did get arrested, but they just deported him and sent him back home. To <laughs> Amen. What I'm trying to tell you is... We don't have any time to waste. But we, we are, I mean, seriously, when you think about it, that, and I might be preaching on this, but the, the, the fact of it is, you see already, though we don't know the day or the hour, so, but we see, we do see the signs of the times. And, and signs of the times are not really for you and I. They're, they're for an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. If you need a sign to believe, then you're in trouble. But, but nevertheless, there are signs, and we can help unbelievers see these signs and say, look, you don't have time. Time is running out. And for the believer, I would say, we see the signs, whether we like it or not, they're ever before us. So are we getting ready? Are we really getting ready for the judgment seat of Christ? I will tell you, we have an open invitation to believers. You can come to this altar any time during this meeting. You say, do I have to come to an altar to get right with God? No, you can get right with God in your seat. You can get right with God when you leave these doors. But why but but why wait? I mean, why wait? And by the way, nobody ever came to an altar of God in the Bible days without bringing a sacrifice. We're not talking about sacrifice for sin. That was done by Jesus and Calvary, right? We're talking about Romans chapter 12. See, when I got saved, I didn't realize, I didn't realize that I had to meet the Lord Jesus at Romans 12, 1 and 2. I didn't realize that. I mean, I, I confessed him as my Lord and Savior, but I didn't know what that really meant. I just knew that I want to live for him, and, 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 and I love him, and, and he's forgiven my sins, amen. But I had no idea what was going to happen to me. I had no idea what would be required of me now that I am a child of a living God. Until I met him at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your body a what? Living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you get the renewing? By being in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Memorize the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Study the Word of God every single day of your life. You wake up in the morning and you say, I don't have a whole lot of time. Well, give them some time. Give them 10 minutes of your morning. Say, I don't have a lot of time in the afternoon when I'm working. Well, give them at least 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Can you give them 10 minutes? Do you know what? We give tithes. I believe in tithing. Amen? Amen. I believe in tithing. But how about give a tithe of your day? Amen. What is that? Two hours and 40 minutes a day? Give a tithe of your day for the Lord. Is that... That is that so much for God? Jesus to ask of you? You split up two hours and forty minutes a day. How much is that? And you divide it into three. Anybody? Help me out. I should have. Anybody know what that is? Sixty. 
Hey, anybody have a calculator? Divide that into three. What is that? Two hours and 40 minutes. All right. Anyway, he's going to find out. So what, what, what is it, brother? What is it? It, it, one hour and what now? 80 minutes. 18? 80. How many? 80. 80 minutes. 80 minutes. So that's a little bit more than that. an hour and a half? An hour and 10 minutes. An hour and 20 minutes. It's an hour and 20 minutes? Wow, we really are mathematicians here, aren't we? <laughs> and what the funny thing about it is I'm a Jew, so I want to know this. Amen? I <laughs> started <laughs> <laughs> oh mercy. <laughs> so an hour and twenty minutes. Is that correct? Is that what's correct? Hour and twenty minutes in the morning. Yeah, is that right? No, that's not, that's not right. right. No, that's that is not right. So two hours, two hours and forty minutes. Divided into three. Fifty-three minutes. What what is it? What? Fifty-three minutes. Fifty-three point three. Is he? Is he right? Yeah. I'm sorry, sis. You meant well. She was divided into two. That's okay. That's that's like I tell like I told my kids. Mama's always right, even if she's wrong, she's right. Like fifty-three point three. So that basically, let's say an hour. Okay, let's say an hour in the morning. Forty-five minutes in the morning. Fifty right in the morning. 45 minutes to an hour in, in the afternoon, 45 minutes to an hour in the evening. Is that so much to ask of you, seeing that Jesus gave his life for you? Yeah. You said, that means i got to wake up an hour earlier. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, oh, I want a horrible thing. And, and then that means that uh, I have to take, uh, I don't know how much, I know when I was working for a big corporation, they gave me an hour for lunch. Mm -hmm. Amen. It was too far to eat, so I, I packed up my, my lunch bag and I packed out for my King James Bible. Amen. Mm -hmm. And people started saying, hey, you read this Bible very much, your lunch bag? I said, yes, I, I have to. Man, shall not live my bread alone. Amen. Amen. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, shall man live. And before I knew it, people would come and gather during lunchtime. I had a little church service there. And then, and then, and then they, they made me the unofficial chaplain of the company. And anytime somebody had a problem, guess who they sent them to? They sent them to me. And I got to give them the gospel and tell, tell them how to solve their problems with the word of God. And then what about the evening? What about your families? You families, you have all the time? You know, all the time. You know what all the time means? It means you, you have a little church in the evening before your kids go to bed. Amen. Yeah, y'all break up, get, get that hymn book out and start singing a song. Even when we were dead beat, when we were so tired, we couldn't even think. We'd sing a song, one stanza. We read even one verse and pray for five minutes and put the kiddies to bed. It wasn't so much the volume as it was the consistency. Every single day, every single day. And by the good grace of God, by the time Samuel, and I give God all the glory here, by the time Samuel, my son, was 19 years old, he had memorized 2,000 memory verses in the Bible. Amen. He'll preach the socks off your feet, glory to God. Amen. And I praise God for my children. I only had two, but the Lord knew that's all I could handle too. But I praise God for my children. I praise God for not only how God's gifted her with music and just, you know, they love God more than anything. They love God more than me. They love God more than their mother. They love Christ. They want to serve Him with all their heart, soul, and mind. Is that what your kids want? Your kids are not going to be any better than you are. If, if your kids turn around, if, 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 if uh, if your parents don't get mad at me, which some will anyway, but that's okay. But parents, listen. If you look at your kids, okay, look here, for example, parents, I want you to look at your kids if they're sitting next to you. Go ahead, turn your head and look at them. Come on. Turn, turn if your kids, just look at them. 
All right, now look at him. All right, see him? All right, see him? I know I lost him in there. That's why I want him in here. That's okay, no problem. But anyway, do you know that, it, is this your, is that, who's who? Is that your son? Look, look, look at him, look, look at him, look at him. <laughs> look at him, it has some boy. You better put a little bodyguard around him, and the girl's gonna be after that boy. <laughs> yeah, man, that's what I had to do with Samuel. We had to put the bodyguards around him. He's so handsome, the girl's after him. <laughs> but I told Samuel, I said, now, Samuel, boy, you better listen to me. Don't you ever give your heart to a girl without my permission. <laughs> and I told the same thing to Naomi. Don't you ever give your heart to a boy without my permission. I'm your protector. Your parents are your safety net. Don't you ever forget that, son. When you look at your son. Look at your son. That's right. Your son is a mirror of yourself. Don't you forget that. If you got all really children because you got some problems in your home. If your children show disrespect to elders because they're looking at you as an example. Your children are a mirror of your life. Right. When they ask my children, again, to God be the glory. I'm not saying we are perfect. We're not perfect. Our family is not perfect. But when they ask my children, what is the main ingredient, one of the main ingredients that you, you embrace Christ so devotedly? What, what is it? There's so many... Preachers, kids go away from God, you know, and it breaks your heart. You know what I'm saying? That happens to some of the some of the best preachers in the world that I know are the kids. And they'll tell you this. My kids will tell you. What what convinced them beyond a, beyond a doubt that Jesus was real and the relationship with Christ was real was they didn't see hypocrisy in mommy and daddy. I'll never forget my mother when I was young. She, she threatened to kill me. She said, if I, if I find a cigarette in your mouth, I will kill you. And she said that while she was smoking a cigarette. <laughs> God help us. I hope, you, I hope you get this. We will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for believers, whether it be good or bad. Yes. And so, if there's anything going to come good out of this conference, it has to be for the believer that you present your body a living sacrifice. Amen. God is not interested in using garbage cans. He said that we need to depart from iniquity, that our vessels ought to be, uh, ought, ought to be sanctified and, and meet for the master's use. And then he says, and prepare unto every good work. Well, you didn't expect me to come and tickle your ears now, did you? Amen. I think you know that I, I do love this church. I love you folks. I, I do speak the truth in love. There's not a mean bone in my body after God saved me. I, 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 I'm a real nice fellow. I think you know I'm a real nice fellow. But I'm going to tell you right now, though, we need to hate sin. We need to be angry at sin. And we need to love the Lord with all our heart, soul, and mind. And then when we think about apostasy, we think about the unsaved. You might be unsaved here. You might not know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're born again. You may not know that your name is written in the last book of life. You may not have that assurance, you know. That if you die today, heaven will be your home. And so when we think about prophecy, and we think about the nearness of the Lord's return, do unsaved people have time to consider? Do we have time to give them? No. Ladies and gentlemen, time is of the essence. There, invite, your, invite your mother, your, your father, your cousins. I, I appreciate cousins being invited. Invite your enemies. Invite everybody. Compel them to come in. I guarantee you that during Exodus chapter 12, they warned the people. They went to their neighbors. The Bible said, I guarantee you they didn't walk 
They ran from house to house, begging and pleading them to get under the blood. Amen. I tell you, time is short, so short. We don't have time to waste. That letter you've been putting off, you need to write that letter. That phone call you've been putting off, you need to. He said, he won't listen to me. Well, give him another, give him another opportunity. On Father's Day was the greatest Father's Day I ever had in my life. Well, somebody got saved. That was that was great. Hey. It was on the Lord's Day. I was preaching, and on, on that on Father's Day, I got word that my mother, my unsaved mother, and you may have heard me ask prayer for my mother, and my unsaved mother is eighty-seven years old, and my dad is ninety-six years old, but my mom, my, my my dad's in the nursing home now, and my mom is eighty-seven, and my mom pulls up my son Samuel and says to him. Son, I need to go to church and I want you to take me to that church I usually go to and she's gone a couple of times. But I want to go. I need to go. I need to go. So my son drove an hour and a half to pick my mother up, took her to the church. And at the end of the, uh, of the meeting there, my mother turns to Samuel and says, how does a person get saved? Amen. 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 Do you realize how difficult it was for my mom to even ask a question like that? Do you realize I've talked to my mom at least 10,000 times in all these years about how to get saved? And yet my mom is asking the question, how does somebody get saved? You see, the veil of Moses is over her eyes. No matter how hard I tried to show her the way, my mom would, would refuse to see. But there's a promise in the Bible in Corinthians that talks about it. That it is the heart of a Jew. If it turns to the Lord, and that's for any, any sinner here, if your heart turns to the Lord, the veil of Moses would be removed from her eyes. Amen. And I believe for the first time in her life, her heart was willing, willing to turn to the Lord. And I believe God removed that veil. And, and my son said, Well, come on now. And uh, anyway, they talked, eventually talked to the pastor. And my mom, my mom got gloriously, wondrously, miraculously saved and born again. Yeah. And I, I'm not into mysticism or magic or anything like that, but I will tell you something's different about my mom. She had a long way to go. She needs a lot of discipleship, and that's what I appreciate about your church. You have a good discipling. You have to have discipling. But my mother, 87, she's very fragile. But I've been praying for her for 47 years. 47 years I begged her to get saved. I said, Mama, it don't, I, 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 told, I asked the Lord, I said, if you've got to take my life, if you've got to leave me, cut my hands off, whatever you got to do to reach my mother. And then about a month or so ago, my dear wife fell seriously ill. And uh, and the first thing came out of my wife's mouth when she found out. Uh, she said these words. She said, "I believe that God has allowed me to be ill like this, so that my mom would get saved." Amen. And when my mom looked at my wife's countenance and saw her, that in spite of a, of a, of a, of a problem that would cause her, her, could cause her her life, she saw her, her countenance and, she, and, and saw her, she wasn't worried about dying. Amen. She said, this got to be, Jesus got to be the Savior. He got to be my Messiah. He got to be the one. It has to be true. She remembered that her sister died a miserable wretch when she died of cancer that just devoured her whole body, her sister, my mom's sister. She remembered that my, my aunt had cursed God to his face and said, what kind of God would allow me to go through this? She rejected the grace of God. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible says in verse 9, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan. He's talking about the Antichrist. With all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, 
Because they received, listen to these words, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You believe Jesus died for everybody? Yes. He's not willing that any should perish, not you, no, nobody. He's not willing that any should perish at all, should come to repentance. Y'all believe that? Amen. Don't give up on anybody. Don't, don't act like, you say, I'm not a Calvinist. No, but you act like a Calvinist. <laughs> say, I've given up on that. Don't you give up on that person. Right. Only God knows that he has a reprobate mind, but you don't know. And you need to win everybody. Amen. Even the guy that curses you out, even the boys that hate your guts. Amen? Amen. Amen. Say, he won't let me tell them the gospel. Well, then live the gospel. Amen. We're living epistles known and read of all men. Live in front of him. Yes. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that they might be saved. You know why? That they might be saved? Because he's mighty to save. Amen. Amen. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Wow. That is some strong language right there. Strong language. Do you want your loved ones to get to the place of rejecting Christ where, where after the rapture uh, they follow the Antichrist and, and, and God will give them a strong delusion to believe a lie? And they'll get the mark of the beast and when you get the mark of the beast you're done for. You might as well prepare your will. You're going to die and spend eternity in the lake of fire. But while you have the opportunity now, before the rapture, before the tribulation comes, Amen. now is the time to choose Amen. Christ. Amen. Right now is the time. Amen. You don't have time to waste. You say, well, I'll give you another day. Give me another hour to think about it. Well, you better not. I'll tell you what, if you're convinced that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life, he, he's the answer to your, your sin question. Don't delay. He's, you got to do it now. Today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not when you feel like it. So let me, let me use the next few minutes here. The second reason of Bible prophecy is to motivate believers to be like Christ. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. He's talking to believers here. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, he's only going to appear to us, by the way, at the rapture. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. See that? You see what, what looking for, for, for Christ who could come at any moment, what it ought to do to you? It ought to purify yourself to get ready, even as he is pure. See, we are pure. Uh, we are justified and sanctified positionally, but we need some daily sanctification. We need our feet and our hands clean every day. By the washing of the water by the word of God. Amen. I don't know about you, but I can't be without the word of God every day. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I, the, the word of God has to be. I have to be meditating on it day and night. You say, well, I, prayer is really important. We ought to pray without ceasing. Well, can I say something? You don't even know how to pray if you're not in the Word. You don't have to pray. We don't. We, we, we've been the Holy Ghost to help us. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse uh, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? What 
motivation, huh? The Lord's going to destroy this planet. And he's going to create a new heaven and new earth one day. And then the Bible says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Right. So even though this is not going to happen right now, it will happen at the end of the millennial kingdom at the great white throne. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you're upset, if you're not a born-again Christian, you need to be thinking about the white throne judgment. If you was to die right now without Christ, you will go to a temporary place called hell. But then you, you will at the great white throne judgment when he opens up the books and your name is that foul written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You will be cast into the lake of fire. That's eternal hell. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not telling you that to scare you. I, I'm just being faithful. That's what the Bible said. If the Bible didn't say it, I couldn't believe in such a horrible place. But it's true. Let, let God be true and every man a liar. So look at him. For you and I as believers, looking, and, you, and for unbelievers, you need to consider that time is short. Nevertheless, we, talking about believers now, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Now, I have preached for 44 minutes. And this last one, we've got one minute left. You said, you, are you being put on a time? No, I'm not. But I'm putting myself on a time. Because you got to be careful when you get a Jew preaching. He might, he might preach until midnight. Give me an amen. amen. <laughs> hey, when I was talking about a Jew, a Jew was invited to preach. Uh, it was Paul, by the way, about saying his long preaching. And he preached for six hours straight. I know that. That's the typical time to start at six o'clock. He preached until about midnight, the Bible says. And all poor Eutychus fell out of the third law. <laughs> you know, Eutychus basically means a uh, lucky one. And he dropped dead. You think everybody go home after that. But business started picking up when Paul put the healing on him. Amen. Yeah. That's when the night gets the spirit was active. It's not active today. We got the Bible. We don't need him. Amen. But I tell you what, the Bible says he kept on preaching until sunrise. Now, wouldn't that be something? That's how you know your church is in the spirit of revival when it doesn't matter what time you finish. Amen. Now, yes, I realize you may have to go to work, you may have to go eat, but then you come back and it keep, keeps on going. Wouldn't that be something? Amen. Wouldn't that be some preacher? Wouldn't that be something that revival broke out in this place? Amen. Man, a lot. I guarantee you, revival broke out in this church, it, it would resonate throughout this whole wicked uh, place, I mean, the region of this country. Amen! And no doubt, probably revival break down the Philippines. I'll tell you what, I've never been to the Philippines, but people tell me, preachers tell me, they, they've got something we, we're missing in America. There's something going on in the Philippines. There's something going on in Sudan. There's something going on where the persecution of believers are. There's, no, there's something going on in Nigeria where every day I get a report that believers getting their heads chopped off or being burned alive. I tell you what, persecution causes revival. Yes. Ah, but anyway, lastly and quickly, 2 Corinthians 5 11. Paul said, as a result of being up there, you know, Paul was up there in the third heaven. That's where paradise is right now. Up in the third heaven. He led cap captivity captive, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? Amen. And he took it up there. He said, Paradise is now in the, in the third heaven. That's what's up there in, in the throne room of God, in that area. And, and he, went, he went up there. In the spirit, he went up there. And this is what he said. This was what motivated him to be such a great soul winner. That's the number three. Bible prophecy motivates you to be a great soul winner. It said there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. I, I, I tell you that, that, that Paul the Apostle 
was probably the most soul winniest <laughs> I guess that's even a word soul winniest apostle among all of them he traveled more miles and by the way your first your first missionary was a Jew don't you ever forget that his name was Paul that's right and he spread the gospel to all of Asia Minor most of the Gentile world had the gospel in fact the Bible says that he turned the world upside they turned the world upside down and every creature the Bible says the Bible says every creature got the gospel when you think about how close we are to the Lord's return it ought to motivate you and I to get the gospel out Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Yes. And we pray that you'll accomplish your perfect will in the hearts of every individual as Pastor comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.